title of my message this morning is Great Faith Equals Great Praise. There have been times in history which call for something extra. There have been times in our lives individually where spiritually, where we were at, spiritually in our walk, where we were at as far as our spiritual strength, was not going to be sufficient to sustain the difficulty that we were in. And I believe this morning that we are at such such a juncture in not only our faith, in our church, but also in our nation. So, great faith equals great praise. And I believe the answer, of course, is from God's Word. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, and verse number 23, I'd like to draw your attention as the Scripture says this, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and were not afraid of the king's commandment. I think the two are linked together. We notice Moses' faith as a result of and in response to his parents' faith. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Help us, Father, as we look at your word. Help us to be helped this morning. If there was ever a time this morning where your people need to be called to faith. It's this morning. Father, if there was ever a time when Satan is pushing and peddling fear, it's now. If there ever was a time when our hearts need to be filled with your peace, if there was ever a time when we need clear direction from above, If there was ever a time, Father, that we needed to be more firmly rooted in your word and in faith, it's today. And so this morning, we lay aside our fears, we lay aside our thoughts, our reasons, our judgments. Lord, this morning, we lay aside our criticisms. And this morning, we look 100% wholeheartedly to you because we must, not we'd like to, we must have a word from above. I pray this morning that we would have hungry hearts. Lord, you said if we opened our mouth wide that you would fill it. And this morning we have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, we've been filling our minds and filling our souls with the husks that Satan has been dumping into our pen. And we know, just like the prodigal, that we would fain fill ourselves with those things. Those things don't fill. They don't satisfy. They don't feed. Father, this morning, feed us from your word. God, I ask you this morning that you would feed your people. And just use me as an instrument to do it. We ask it in your name. Amen. Hebrews 11 is a consummate chapter on faith. By faith Moses, verse 23 tells us, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. Isn't it interesting that even at a young age you can tell what mannerisms and what kind of a child a child is 
this morning I received uh, two little uh, responses from my sons with little short videos of the kids, which I enjoyed seeing. And uh, I'm so thankful that they did not get their naughtiness from my side of the family. They hid Moses. Why did they hide him? Well, 23 tells us. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. I'm not going to expound on this part fully, but there is a Moses principle here when we understand what the king's commandment was. The king's commandment was that their children be turned over to him. And ladies and gentlemen, 2020 is no different than the days of Moses' parents. We are being told as parents that we ought to turn our children over to a godless government that they know better than what God knows, that they know better what you know, and they know better than what the Scripture says about raising children. They are wrong! We have never had a time like now that is ripe for godly leadership. And I hope that parents, that you understand, don't blame the pastor, don't blame your boss, don't blame your mom, your dad. You have the responsibility to raise your child in your home in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Don't ever come and say, Pastor, I don't know what happened. I had, I had my child in your church. Friend, I can't undo in two hours a week what you failed to do 24-7 in your home. I hope we take it seriously to not cave to the king's commandment. That's not the message. I don't know why you got me off on that. What was the king's commandment? Turn your child over. And that child would be cast into the river to be either drowned or eaten by the wild beast in that river because they wanted no more righteousness in their land. They said, we've had enough righteousness. This people, they're getting too strong. They're getting too great. So let's get rid of the children. Keep in mind, we're only speaking about the birth of a child. The Bible tells us, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi and the woman conceived and bare a son and when she saw him that he was a goodly child she hid him three months and when he could no longer she could no longer hide him she took him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's bank and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked alongside the riverside, and when they saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him, and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And said to his sister, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go to call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Why did this series of events unfold? Because of the great faith of Moses' mother. There never would have been a river rescue. There never would have been the incredible story of Miriam suggesting to the Pharaoh's daughter that they go get the child's mother to nurse her own child under the auspices of the Pharaoh's house so that this child would be raised and cared for even though all Hebrew children had been commanded to be killed, but there would be an exemption to that because there was a mother that said, No, I am not going to do this. I am not going to obey the king's commandment. It took a measure of faith beyond what we can understand. 
and her great faith was rewarded. Moses' parents, who in the moment decided not to turn their child over to Egypt, to not allow their child to be destroyed in the Nile River, took this act of great faith, and many parents before them had done what the king said, and no doubt they did not show judgment to those parents, but what they said is, it will be different with us. And they did not obey the king's commandment. I want you to think of James and John in the book of Acts chapter number 3. They went up to the temple and they beheld a man that was healed standing with them. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred amongst themselves saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. It is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, so we cannot deny it. But that it spread further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they may speak henceforth to no man of this name. And they called them and commanded them to not speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God, to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things for which we have seen and heard. They were placed under a threat saying, Don't preach, don't teach, don't use the name of Jesus. Were they afraid? I'm sure they were afraid. John the Baptist had been beheaded. James would be beheaded as the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. It was Peter very shortly that was placed in the jail for intention of being killed, and Stephen, the first martyr, was real close at hand. So they lived in difficult times. And these times of duress, they had to make a decision of whether or not they were going to respond in faith or whether they would respond in fear. And the disciples said, we just can't get away from this. I'm sorry what your commandment is, but we just can't stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they displayed great faith, just like Moses' parents displayed. This was the atmosphere that caused Stephen very shortly to be stoned to death. I'm just going to be honest with you, and I love you enough to tell you this. I have never seen more cowering Christians in my life and I'm thinking to myself, where is the faith? Where is the faith? I tell you this this morning. I fear God more than I fear Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Why are we so weak, need, and afraid? Like somehow... Somebody has come in on the scene that has just whipped away everything from us. I don't understand it. I'm calling on you this morning to begin to display great faith in your Christian walk. Boldness, like the disciples showed. Great faith, relying on a great God. Not depending on yourself and what you can do, but depending on God's reputation and what God can do. God delivered Paul and Silas in prison. Paul was delivered from a venomous snake. And Peter was delivered from jail in a miraculous way. Where did all of this start? It all started and always starts with great faith. I promise you, if Moses' parents had not displayed faith, we would not have seen the miracle that ensued. It starts with great faith. It starts by you affirming your faith in God. You need to do that today. God, I believe in you. My faith is in you. Number two. Great faith is always coupled with great prayer. It's not just saying, oh, I believe in God. 
Because faith is not just a feeling. Faith is an action. And one of the actions that ensues when we demonstrate our faith in God, it must be prayer. What prayer does is prayer takes the feelings of faith and focuses them directly on God. I'm going to read three verses that will show us that faith is more than just saying, I have this strong feeling that God somehow is going to make everything good, but faith is taking our feelings and focusing them on God. Here's Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Eden, under uh, Garden of Gethsemane, under great duress, and he is speaking to his father, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Great faith accompanied by great prayer. Nobody could say of our Savior that Jesus was not a man of prayer. And when Jesus was in the hour of temptation, the prayer ratcheted up. Great prayer. He told the disciples, he said, could you not watch with me one hour? Listen to what James says in chapter 5 and verse 17. Elias, meaning Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. There were times when Elijah was afraid. (laughs) There were times when Elijah went and hid himself. That's sometimes what I feel like doing. When I see mean church people come, I just want to hide. I don't want to hear any more. That's me in my natural flesh. I say, I'm not turning the news on because I don't want to hear no more negativity. I'm afraid of what I hear. That's me in my flesh. And the Bible says Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And Jezebel said, I'm not going to get you. I think Jezebel, that name in Hebrew, is somehow related to um, one of our ladies in Congress. I'm very sure. I looked it up in my biblical dictionary, and uh, there was a picture of Mrs. Pelosi there. There really was. And so Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Here's a man. That's just like we are. But he displayed great faith and great faith moved him to, what's the word? Prayer. I want to ask you, in the last nine months, has your prayer time and your prayer life been strengthened or diminished? Are you praying in a meaningful way? Have you gotten to a point to say, you know, we're in difficult times and because of that, I need to get up a little earlier and I'm going to dedicate more time to prayer. The times demand it. My family demands it. The challenges that we are facing day to day, just trying to keep our church family intact and on track, it just demands more prayer. And so I'm going to not diminish prayer, but I'm going to increase prayer. Elias was a man subject to like passions, and he prayed earnestly. Notice that word. Then Jude chapter 1, verse number 3 says this, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend. Notice that word earnestly again. You say, Pastor, what does the word earnestly in prayer have to do with one another? You, know, you notice that word earnestly and what it means? Very unique word. It's only used a few times in the scripture. The word earnestly means to be stretched out. So we're not talking about somebody who's standing up while they're praying. We're talking about somebody who is stretched out. Now, why is that important? It is a posture of humility. Boy, if we live in a day and age where humility is on the thin edge, it's now. And it's all about pride. And I noticed when all of this first started happening, I noticed in the first month or two that I noticed people were just a little extra kind, a little bit nicer to one another. But everybody's tired now, and that's gone. And I have never seen, I have never seen such rudeness and hostility of people one to another. And I'm just talking about 
family members to one another, Christians to one another, much let alone the general public. The word earnestly, when we are earnestly praying, it's a posture of humility. Did you know that it's a posture of surrender? Oftentimes, somebody would, uh, when, when they were defeated, they would lay down. And it was up to the individual that they were giving themselves up to or surrendering to, whether they would kill them or keep them alive. But they were completely yielding themselves. They were saying, it's your choice. Do with me as you will. I am yielding myself to you. You notice how that's attached to prayer? I wonder how many of us have said this week, Father, in these dire times and uncertain times, I yield myself completely and wholly to you. That's earnestly praying, making yourself vulnerable. And that is the separating distinction between prayer and great prayers. It is the distinction between prayer and the prayer of faith. James said that the prayer of faith would heal, uh, would heal the sick and he's not talking about God bless all those that are sick. He's talking about somebody who is yielded and humbled to the Lord and says, Lord, whatever your will is, we want that will accomplished, but here's earnestly what I am asking from you. Great prayer is prayer that sticks your neck out by faith and asks God to do unbelievable things that are impossible by human standards. And when I look at our world and the day that we live by human standards, I say this, our nation needs healing, but I just don't see how that's possible. You know what Will, William Carey said? He's a tremendous missionary from days gone by. William Carey said this, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. We can expect great things from God and attempt great things for Him when we step out by faith to serve Him because we understand that He is great. William Carey was known as the father of modern missions. But one thing about William Carey is this. William Carey knew something about faith, but then praying in faith. I have learned that I can expect great things from God and attempt things great attempt great things for him when he leads me to step out in faith and in prayer I am beseeching him and laying on him it only comes through great faith that is coupled with great prayers number three when we pray these great prayers it's not just God do something God do something God do something God do something it's a great reliance on God the key to expecting great things from God and attempting great things for Him is realizing that He is the one accomplishing the work through us and our motive must be that we have total reliance on Him. Do you expect great things from God? Are you attempting to do great things for Him? We can only do these things when we are displaying great reliance on Him. Listen to the Psalms. I chose just three. Psalm 66.3 Say unto God, How terrible art, art thou in thy works! Through the greatness of thy power shall my enemies submit themselves unto thee. Psalm 48.1 Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God and the mountain of His holiness. Psalm 77.13 Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great as our God? I love the Word of God because it teaches me to have faith. It teaches me to pray in faith, but it teaches me also reliance. Reliance on God. There are things sometimes in our life that are moments that cause us to have great reliance on God. I remember one such time I was thinking uh, yesterday as I was thinking on these things what was one such time that you just really had to display great faith and reliance on God I remember many years ago that Ethan would have little seizures 
And that was disturbing to me. That was disturbing to Sherry as well. And we set up an appointment where he went to the hospital and they put these electrodes on his head to see if there was any brain activity. The test came back negative. Now, I'm teasing. It was very serious. And I remember around that time that uh, there was a commercial uh, that came on when our, I was watching the news, and it must have been around this time of the year where they encouraged people to give. It was for St. Jude's. They were show, showing some of the children that were ill, and I just couldn't watch it. I turned it off. It just, it was too much. And this whole thing was just too much for me. And I told the Lord, Lord, I, just, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I think somewhere we have a photo of Ethan with all these electrodes hooked up to his head. Do you have a photo of that? And I just thought to myself, I, I just, I can't do this. And from a human perspective, the truth is, yes, we can't do those things. Faith through prayer and great reliance on God is always followed by deliverance. In the book of Joshua, chapter 10, I'm not going to read it, but I'll detail for you that God was leading his people into battle. They had a fight against a group of individuals that for years had plagued them and had victory over them. These were individuals who were very mean. They were very vile in what they would do if they won the victory. And many, many times they had come in and spoiled God's people. And on this particular day, God showing his strength and his might through his people. They were relying on him. Joshua was leading the people. And they were winning the victory. But the sun was setting. And it seemed like they would lose because they ran out of time. And God had Joshua, through an act of incredible faith, command the sun and the moon to stop. Now you can calculate it out scientifically, and it will be proved scientifically that the sun and the moon stood still at Joshua's behest out of an act of faith prompted by God's will. And the Bible says this about it. I love it. The Bible says there was no day like it. God did something absolutely incredible because God delivers His people who act in great faith coupled with great prayer and show great reliance on Him. It was so unique, so incredible, so amazing, so extraordinary, so over the top. What does all of this bring us to? Ladies and gentlemen, it brings us to great praise. Some think that great faith engenders great praise. It does, but it isn't immediate. We live in perilous times. It's time to get your faith on. But you'll never have faith unless you get a word from God. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. And when you decide that you have God's word on it, the seedbed of faith is the word of the Lord. But let me share with you a secret as we finish up the message. Great praise begins before deliverance. Great praise begins before deliverance. Paul and Silas were stuffed into jail. They'd been badly beaten. And it looked by all counts that Satan had won and they were just in jail licking their wounds. But at midnight, there was a sound heard. It was Paul and Silas. They were praising. And God delivered after the prayers, after the praises were elevated. And the great secret in our midnight is that one of the most powerful things that we can learn about praising God is not waiting till we think we've received something praiseworthy, but just beginning to praise Him right where we're at. You know, one of the things that this 
current situation has stripped away from God's people. Not only being able to meet in public together, but the corporate praise of God's people. The corporate praise of God's people. God's people praising the Lord together. That's what Paul and Silas were doing. They were praising God. I trust that you understand that this year does not call for a day of thanksgiving on Thursday. This year calls for a week of thanksgiving. We need to have a whole week of it. A week of it! Where we just praise our God. Sometimes we praise God for what He's done for us. And those are called prayers of thanksgiving. And that is a form of praise. Sometimes we praise God simply for who He is, not what He's done. And sometimes that's called worship of God. Sometimes we just praise the Lord and we just love on Him. Great faith equals great praise. How does that happen? When we step out in great faith, and then we couple that together with great prayer, earnestly praying. And that demonstrates a great reliance on God. We don't have a plan B. He is our plan B. He's our plan A, B, C, and D. And then we experience great deliverance. It always is followed with great praise, but great praise begins before the deliverance. We need to praise the Lord. Not just for what he's done, but for who he is. Included in what he's done. Who's going to be first? Ray. Amen. Praise God for it. Who's next? Brother Larry. Amen. Amen. Somebody else. Brother Bayless, go ahead. Praise God for his peace. There was another hand over here. Brother Steve. Praise God for his wonderful acts that he's yet to do. What he's promised to do. Somebody else? Let's praise God. Go ahead, Angela. Let's praise God for his faithfulness. The sun rises, the sun sets. Just a testament to God's faithfulness. Somebody else? Sherry? Praise God for his word. It never changes. Brother Lenny? Praise God for the cross of Christ. That, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Somebody else? You're going to praise the Lord. Go ahead. Amen. Praise the Lord for Terry and that Terry is able to be home. Brother Jamie, praise God for family. God shows his love to us oftentimes with those that he circles around us. Somebody else want to praise God? Brother Drew? Amen. Praising God for a couple of kids. He'll be thanking the Lord on April 15th, even more. Somebody else praising God. Mrs. Lundine. Thank God for his provision. He has not failed. He has provided and has shown himself faithful all the way through. Somebody else want to praise God, Chelsea? Praise God for his daily blessings. The Bible says he daily loadeth us with blessings. He just pours on so much that we can't take it all. Somebody else want to praise God? Ethan? Praise God for employment. What a blessing. Let's make it a week of thanksgiving. We will demonstrate our faith by the praise that we give to Him and the things that accompany that great faith will lead us to great praise. I don't want to give God a week measure of praise this week I want him to get all the praise all the glory in my life 
for me personally that he deserves all that I can give.